Hi, everybody. Sorry to leave you hanging. We will start in just a few moments. For those of you who already joined, um, we're just waiting for a few more people to log in since it's um, in the evening, and I know it takes a little bit to get going. Um, we will, um, like I said, start in a few minutes. If you just joined, please take a note of um, some of the, the information on your screen. We'll remind you of that in a moment as well. If you'd like, also, of course, you can please introduce yourselves in the chat so we know who you are and where you work and what you do. Um, and then I think everybody knows this, but you know, please stay on mute until we have our Q&A section at the end. So I'll pop back on a few minutes and then we'll get going. Okay, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'm sure people will still join as we get going. Um, I think everybody was on when I said this, but I'll just say it again. Welcome to unit four, session three. This is the final lecture in our lecture series. So we're super excited that you're able to join us. If you've been attending our lecture series, um, you know that there's been lots of great information um, and we appreciate you hanging in there with us um, as we've done this. Um, on the screen are a few reminders, um, but just to let you know, as you probably already know, we are recording this lecture. So if you are interested in looking back at it or you have colleagues who weren't able to join tonight, um, they are welcome to go to the ACES Aware Ventura website in order to access um, the presentation. We will be doing a Q&A session tonight, uh, both myself and uh, Dr. Van Antwerp are on the line. So we'll be able to do that um, following the presentation. So if you have questions, keep them in your head. You're welcome to put them in the chat as we go along as well. Um, all in attendance will be entered into a drawing for a custom ACES Aware Ventura County prize. We're going to announce the drawing winner um, in our session follow-up email. So be on the lookout for an email from ACES Aware Ventura County. And then in your registration and evaluation, please make sure that you noted whether you are requesting continuing education. And if you are looking for CEs, then uh, make sure you're present for the entire session and complete your evaluation so that you can receive those credits. If you have not already done so, I saw a few names um, pop up um, on, in the chat. Please introduce yourself and let us know where you're from. Although I see a lot of familiar names on the screen, so good to see everybody. Um, but before we begin, uh, we are going to hear some words from Dr. Landon.
Hi everyone. Thank you for joining us for this session that is part of the AAVC Provider Training Lecture Series. We hope this session is both informative and engaging for you. Don't forget to register and complete the evaluation so we know who our audience is and how to improve in the future. All who register, including those who are watching this as a recording, will be entered into a raffle for a special ACES Aware of Ventura County Prize. This lecture is being recorded so you can have access to it on our website at any time. Thank you for joining us on our mission to bring better help, better health, and better hope to Ventura County and beyond. So this is kind of a fun session for me because as you probably uh, saw in your emails, uh, this one is being presented with uh, Dr. Kathleen Van Antwerp, a good colleague of mine and myself. So this is kind of cool to have a double role tonight where I'm presenting the information and I get to stay on and do the Q&A. So as I mentioned, Dr. Van Antwerp is here on the line as well. And so we will be um, answering your questions or you know, looking for comments after we're done with the presentation. We're excited to present on um, supporting a resilient Ventura County through a trauma-informed network of care. Some of you were aware that we were doing some work through an ACEs Aware initiative grant uh, that the Partnership for Safe Families, our uh, local child abuse prevention council, or the CAPC, received and uh, did along with, in partnership with First Five Ventura County when I was working there through Help Me Grow. And we were working on developing a plan for how to build a network of care um, through the ACEs network for Ventura County. So we're excited to kind of present what that, what the vision is, uh, what it looks like uh, when we were working on the grant and what our future vision will be for this in Ventura County. So with that, um, I'm going to read our bios <laughs> and I'll start with Dr. Van Antwerp, um, who many of you already know. So you know how amazing she is. Um, but Dr. Van Antwerp is a leader in educational juvenile justice and youth outreach program reform. Some of her roles include executive director of the Ventura County Child Abuse Prevention Council, executive co-director of Full Circle Consulting Systems Incorporated, inclusion diversity and equity trainer, um, statewide education agencies, lead trainer and consultant for, this, uh, for statewide law enforcement agencies, certified mental health trainer um, at the National Center for Youth Opportunity and Justice, state certified trainer, board of community corrections, and co-author of I Can't Come to School Today, My Mom's in Prison and I Don't Have a Ride. So for over 30 years, she has been at the forefront of developing effective educational and youth outreach programs for at-risk children and adolescents in public schools, court and community schools, emergency care shelters, foster care and juvenile hall. She is a transformative family engagement specialist. She has led the way in introducing the science of child and adolescent development to juvenile crime prevention programs, law enforcement agencies, probation officers, and juvenile court judges, directly transforming, and there is Dr. Van Amper, glad you've turned on your video, um, directly transforming the operations of youth outreach centers and community policing throughout the United States, England, Austria, and Amsterdam. With over 20 years of classroom teaching experience, primarily with at-risk students, she teaches specialized courses at California University State and Community Colleges to mitigate adverse childhood or, and community and curricular experiences. Her work has been published in books and journals nationally and internationally. Pretty impressive. So we're so glad. I, I was actually thrilled to be able to co-present this with Dr. Van Antwerp um, because as we know, she's awesome. Um, and then a little bit about me. I know some of you already know me, but I am a BCBA, a board certified behavior analyst. Um, and I have a PhD in education uh, from uh, UCSB or University of California, Santa Barbara um, in special education, disabilities and risk studies with a special emphasis in autism. I'm currently working as a BCBA or board certified behavior analyst for Ventura County SELPA, and I'm contracted to provide behavioral support to Ventura Unified School District. Prior to this, and which is when this work was all happening, um, I was working with First Five Ventura County. I know a, a former colleague of mine is on the line where I was leading the Help Me Grow initiative and worked with the pediatric and early childhood community on early identification, referral, and care coordination for young children with developmental and behavioral needs. Um, as a behavioral and developmental specialist, I've consulted with and provided training for providers, a variety of providers, including those in uh, the medical field, um, as well as in education, in early intervention and more. And I've also worked directly with families of children with behavioral disorders, such as autism. 
Uh, I'm also teaching courses in applied behavior analysis as adjunct faculty for what is now called the University of Massachusetts Global, but was formerly called Brandman University. So again, as I said, after the lecture, we will answer questions. Please keep them in mind as we go through the presentation. Um, and so with that, I will turn it over to the presentation. Thank you for that introduction, Lucy. Today, we'll be talking about the trauma-informed network of care supporting a resilient Ventura County. My name is Sharon Elmenstorp. Hi, I'm Kathleen Van Antwerp. As you can see on the slide in front of you, we have tremendous local partnerships with our community. So many partners have come together to do the work of ACEs Aware. The learning objectives for today will be to one, define adverse childhood experiences or ACEs and their prevalence, health disparities in these data, the toxic stress response, and related impacts on health, including underlying biological mechanisms. We're also going to present strategies to establish an effective system to respond to ACEs and mitigate the toxic stress response. We'll define key elements of a trauma-informed network of care to respond to ACEs and toxic stress. And lastly, we'll describe Ventura County's process for building a network of care. The mission of ACEs Aware in Ventura County is to change and save lives by helping providers understand the importance for screening for adverse childhood experiences and training providers to respond with trauma-informed care to mitigate the health impacts of toxic stress. So before we talk about strategies in the network of care, we wanna remind you about some key aspects of ACE screening. First of all, many of the recommendations and strategies that are in our presentation today come from the California Surgeon General's Roadmap for Resilience. You can find this on acesaware.org and it can be downloaded as a PDF. The Roadmap for Resilience really is a blueprint for recognizing and effectively addressing ACEs and toxic stress. It provides cross-sector strategies for sectors including healthcare, public health, social services, early childhood, education, justice, and many more. The blueprint strategizes or prioritizes prevention, equity and outcomes, enhanced coordination across sectors. This roadmap was developed by experts across specialties and disciplines, and is focused on science-based approaches to primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention strategies, many of which we'll discuss later in the presentation. Exposure to ACEs, in particular in the absence of protective factors, can alter the biological stress response, disrupt the development of neuroendocrine immune metabolic and genetic regulatory mechanisms, lead to toxic stress responses, thus increasing risk for health problems, physical, mental, and behavioral. In other presentations, you've heard details about the increased risk for nine out of the 10 leading causes of death, including the top two, heart disease and cancer. What this visual is trying to show us is how parental ACEs and toxic stress may lead to multiple biological changes that can impact the health of parents' children. Intergenerational transmission of toxic stress occurs when adverse experiences alter parental biology or behavior in ways that affect the development and health of their children. This includes changes to parental and child neuro, endocrine, immune, metabolic, as well as genetic and genetic regulatory functions in ways that matter for preconception health and also influence pregnancy, birth, infant and child health outcomes. Parenting behaviors, positive experiences, societal factors and historical traumas also influence the way that health risks are passed on from parent to child. So essentially this highlights the importance of screening for both children and for adults. As a reminder, the purpose of ACE screening is not to identify specific ACEs per se, but to identify patients at risk for developing the toxic stress response or experiencing ACE-associated health conditions. ACEs are not destiny. ACE screenings and scores are indicative of overall risk of a toxic stress response, but are not individually deterministic. ACEs are not destiny. With early detection and evidence-based intervention, we can transform health outcomes. ACEs are not destiny. 
Even when treatment comes later in life, it is known that for individuals with ACEs, addressing the resulting toxic stress physiology is important for improving ACE-associated health conditions, as well for averting future consequences. As noted in other talks, there are several reasons to screen for ACEs. Improve efficacy and efficiency of health care. Better support individual and family health and well-being interrupt the intergenerational transmission of ACEs and toxic stress, and reduce long-term health care costs. Now, these tools should be familiar to you either because you're already using them in your practice or you've seen them in one of our presentations. So we're not going to go into a lot of detail about the screening tools themselves or how to implement them in your practice. You can find additional information at acesaware.org. You can download the screening tools, or you can refer back to one of our other training presentations. For the purpose of this presentation, the key element to highlight is that by screening, we can identify individuals experiencing ACEs or who are at risk for developing toxic stress, which means we have the opportunity to connect them to resources to mitigate the toxic stress response and potentially prevent or limit the impact on health, particularly for children. With adults, there's also the opportunity to prevent the vertical transmission of ACEs and toxic stress. For both adults and children, the key to successful screening is access to systems that can offer education, protective resources, and treatment. Now we'll be discussing strategies to respond to ACEs and mitigate the toxic stress response and implications for community resources. These next few slides should look familiar to you as they were also referenced in other lectures in this series. We wanted to provide a foundation for these strategies and begin to draw a line between these strategies and the larger community of care and resources. For more in-depth information, please see other lectures in this series. The primary thread that should run through all responses of intervention is trauma-informed care. These are the basic principles of trauma-informed care that have been discussed more broadly in other presentations. We wanted to remind you of the basic principles. These will also become relevant as we talk about how these principles are applied to a larger network of care. Establish the physical and emotional safety of patients and staff. Build trust between providers and patients. Recognize the signs and symptoms of trauma exposure on physical and mental health. Promote patient-centered, evidence-based care. Ensure provider and patient collaboration by bringing patients into the treatment process and discussing mutually agreed upon goals for treatment. Provide care that is sensitive to the patient's racial, ethnic, and cultural background and gender identity. We know that a main ingredient in the recipe to disrupt ACEs and toxic stress is resilience. Resilience is the result of a dynamic set and his or her protective factors. This interaction is what determines the developmental path towards health and well-being or towards illness and dysfunction. The presence of protective factors, particularly safe, stable, and nurturing relationships, can often mitigate the consequences of ACEs. Protective factors help explain how some people who have sustained a great deal of adversity as children have fared relatively well in adulthood. Protective factors can include a person's own biological and developmental characteristics, but protective factors can also include characteristics of the family, community, and systems that mitigate the negative impacts of ACEs. It is this last factor that becomes essential as we consider how to respond to ACEs and toxic stress from a community-based perspective. Again, you may have seen the Wheel of Stress Busters before. These are the seven evidence-based strategies for toxic stress mitigations from the Surgeon General's report. Healthy relationships, high quality sufficient sleep, balanced nutrition, regular physical activity, mindfulness and meditation, access to nature, behavioral and mental health care. The challenge for medical providers when it comes to these stress busters is helping patients access these evidence-based buffering supports. Certainly for some patients, providing education and information about the stress busters can be helpful. For others, however, more support is needed for them to access them or sustain their use so that the supports can mitigate the toxic stress response. 
This requires a larger network of resources that patients can plug into. More to come on how we are building that network here in Ventura County. We also know that to effectively address ACEs and toxic stress requires action on three levels, primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention, or prevention, early recognition, and early evidence-based intervention. Primary prevention efforts target healthy individuals and aim to prevent harmful exposures from ever occurring. Secondary prevention efforts involve screening to identify individuals who've experienced an exposure and aim to prevent the development of symptoms, disease, or other negative outcomes. Tertiary prevention efforts target individuals who have already developed a disease or social outcome and aim to lessen the severity, progression, or complications associated with that outcome. The Roadmap to Resilience offers more in-depth information about the types of services that fall in each of the three levels. But let's think about these levels from a purely logistical perspective. In order to provide patients with access to a comprehensive and wide range of services that fall into these levels, also requires knowledge about comprehensive and wide-ranging community resources. We know that physicians have reported being hesitant to screen until they are clear on what an evidence-based treatment response could be in a healthcare setting. Luckily, research is showing that preventative services can be effective when provided in a coordinated way. Recognizing other risk factors for toxic stress. A circumstance, exposure, or condition with documented associations with increased likelihood or susceptibility of development of the toxic stress response. For example, historical and current events such as racism and discrimination and the COVID-19 pandemic have impacts for toxic stress. Recognizing these additional risks is important since they often co-occur with ACEs, contribute to their prevalence and can exasperate their impacts. It is also crucial to understand and address the ways in which these factors may compound the cumulative dose of adversity and reduce caregivers' ability to provide safe, stable, and nurturing relationships and environments, particularly given the disproportionate burden of ACEs in marginalized communities. Let's take a moment to define the social determinants of health and how these additional adversities are risk factors for toxic stress. According to the Center for the Developing Child at Harvard University, social determinants of health are conditions in the environments in which people live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health, functioning, and quality of life outcomes and risks. The social determinants of health are education, employment, health systems and services, housing, income and wealth, the physical environment, public safety, the social environment, including structures, institutions, and policies, and transportation. While validated odds ratios are available in large population-based studies using the 10 standardized ACE criteria, the 10 criteria you'll find on the ACE screening questionnaire, as well as part one of the PEARL screening questionnaire, the strengths of association between other experiences or social determinants of health and health outcomes have not been similarly standardized. But we do recognize that these additional risks are important since they often co-occur with ACEs, contribute to their prevalence, and can exacerbate their impacts. As we've mentioned before, it is important to recognize that the 10 ACEs identified in the landmark CDC Kaiser Permanente study are not the only risk factors for toxic stress and subsequent health disparities. Other factors, such as racial discrimination related to race, living in poverty, separation from a parent or a caregiver for other reasons like deportation or migration, exposure to climate disasters, or even a medical trauma may also be risk factors for toxic stress. Knowing that there are evidence-based strategies that can mitigate the toxic stress response and ACEs, and knowing that there are challenges associated with connecting patients to these strategies, we can begin to frame the conversation toward developing a coordinated approach, including developing a resource network or grid that can be accessed by providers and patients alike. The California Surgeon General, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, through the ACEs Aware Initiative has developed a lofty goal to reduce ACEs and toxic stress by half in one generation. To do so, these are the strategies developed by the initiative. You've been participating in a training that has effectively addressed the first two. Now we're going to focus on the third, the development of a functional network of care. 
ACEs Aware Trauma-Informed Network of Care Roadmap. Per the California Surgeon General and the cross-sector team of experts involved in the ACEs Aware initiative, there is a recognition that clinical interventions are necessary but not sufficient to reduce the health impacts of ACEs and toxic stress. Cross-sector coordination, including with healthcare delivery systems, is necessary. Many sectors play a critical role in supporting patients by continuing to provide access to evidence-based stress mitigation strategies. ACEs Aware has developed a trauma-informed network of care roadmap to specifically guide communities in developing an effective network of care, and this can be found on the acesaware.org website. A trauma-informed network of care is a group of interdisciplinary health, education, and human service professionals and community members and organizations that support adults, children, and families by providing access to evidence-based buffering resources that help to prevent, treat, and heal the harmful consequences of toxic stress. Milestones for communities to build a network of care. The common ingredient needed in each community is a strong and collaborative group of leaders to guide the network of care and its efforts to integrate healthcare providers into the existing structure. Identifying entities and individuals who can provide leadership and accountability for a trauma-informed network of care deserves careful consideration. If a structure is not already in place, but more importantly, the leadership and accountability structure can identify a series of shared goals amongst trauma-informed network of care entities and the communities that they serve. Viewing healthcare providers as necessary partners within the trauma-informed network of care is likely to enhance and sustain efforts to address the needs of individuals who are at risk for toxic stress. Open communication, the ability to have conversations about roles and responsibilities, and keeping the patient at the center of the care team will help form a cohesive, trauma-informed network of care. Breaking down silos. Working to integrate multiple fields in a meaningful way is a process based primarily on relationship building. Once a network of care has been established, the leadership team can create opportunities for relationship building and shared learning. Bi-directionality. This is another important component. Through this bi-directional partnership, medical providers and their care teams integrate other health and human services into clinical workflows by building and maintaining ongoing relationships with community resources and in turn, the community organizations actively engage with the healthcare community to ensure communication and follow-up regarding ACEs screening and response. A robust trauma-informed network of care may have an infrastructure that allows for shared learning, ongoing ACE screening, implementation, training, and networking opportunities. Funding for this type of infrastructure is helpful, but not always necessary. It's most important to create the human infrastructure to keep the work sustainable. While not required, infrastructure funding can allow for a digital technology platform that facilitates bi-directional referrals and marries multiple electronic health records and data sharing platforms. To make process improvements among trauma-informed network of care partners, it will be important to engage the leadership and accountability structure in place. See milestone number one in this section to help identify those who will focus on quality improvement, QI activities. Just like there are milestones for communities, there are also milestones for clinical teams to build a network of care. So I'm just gonna read what some of those milestones are, but if you want more information about each of these milestones, see, please see page 46 of the Network of Care Roadmap. Milestone number one is to conduct a readiness assessment. Number two, define your clinical roles and tasks. Number three, gather resources and get to know your network of care, which is what you're doing today. Mm -hmm. Number four, consider financing and technology needs. And number five, monitor, evaluate, and improve referral process. 
Ventura County, we are weaving a robust network of care. The primary objective of our local ACES Aware Network of Care is funded through a series of grants. The primary objective is to build and strengthen robust networks of care to effectively respond to adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress with community-based health and social supports that meet the needs of children, adults, and families. 35 organizations were awarded $30.8 million. There were eight implementation grants and 27 planning grants. The Partnership for Safe Families and Communities, the Child Abuse Prevention Council of Ventura County, received a planning grant in the beginning of this year. We partnered with First Five Ventura County, who is one of our main partners, and 46 other community partners have joined us in weaving together our Ventura County Network of Care. The second round of ACES Aware grant funds sought to build on and grow a robust system, or the network of care, to support Medi-Cal providers and their communities in effectively responding to ACEs and implementing protocols for interrupting the toxic stress response in both children and adults. The objective of these networks of care grants was to create, augment, and sustain formal connections between Medi-Cal providers, social service systems, and community partners to effectively address toxic stress in children and adults, through clinical and community interventions, following an ACE screening to prevent future ACEs, toxic stress, and intergenerational transmission, and to prevent or assist in treating ACE-associated health conditions. What are the goals of the Ventura County Network of Care Planning Grant? One, to engage with Ventura County Medi-Cal providers trained in ACEs-aware practices to identify gaps between needs identification and service implementation. The second goal is to create and maintain a centralized database of available resources in Ventura County, including investment in care coordination software to increase our capacity to manage and document services offered to families served. This database will also allow for appropriate follow-up and evaluation of overall support offerings, including resources in key languages. Goal number three of the Ventura County Network of Care is to hire, train, and support a community care coordinator who will serve as an intermediary between Medi-Cal providers trained in ACEs screening and resource options within Ventura County to support families, access, and connection to comprehensive services for children's optimal development and well-being. The fourth goal of Ventura County's Network of Care is to identify and train a team of community care interns led by the community care coordinator to maximize individual connections between families, medical professionals, and aligned services. The fifth goal, to expand First Five Ventura County's Help Me Grow model to support children and their families with high ACE scores and align care for all children across the developmental spectrum to lead to greater access for screenings, referrals, and intervention services for children and families. Goal number six, to train member agencies in strategies to address ACEs so that all are highly qualified to serve referred families. And the seventh goal of the Ventura County Network of Care is to identify strategies to link leverage and lift successful processes beyond Ventura County to further refine and broaden high quality implementation practices under ACEs Aware. If you recall, Kathleen talked about the milestones for communities in building a network of care. For milestone number one, which was the leadership and accountability structure, in Ventura County, we have what's called the E4C VC, which stands for Essentials for Childhood Ventura County. This is a cross-sector community engagement team that identifies and prioritizes the complex community problems, issues that may impact multiple systems in our county. The E4C VC uses the CDC's Essentials for Childhood framework. There are multiple goals for the E4C VC. Goal number one is to strengthen and expand the effectiveness, efficiency, and equity of the health and human services across the continuum, as well as community opportunities for success provided to all Ventura children and their families. Number two, 
cross-sector community engagement to identify and prioritize the complex community problems or issues that impact multiple systems. And number three, to generate the ideas, innovation, and public will to improve the access, outcomes, and quality of care for the children and their families. The E4C VC includes a steering committee, a capacity building committee, a data committee, and a family engagement or parent voices committee, which we'll talk about more in a moment. The current agencies on the steering committee include Beacon Health Options, Child Development Resources, Family Justice Center, the California Office of Child Abuse and Prevention, Oxnard School District, Ventura County Probation Agency, Ventura County Behavioral Health, the Ventura County Healthcare Agency, the Ventura County Human Services Agency, Ventura County Office of Education, Ventura County Public Health, and of course, the Partnership for Safe Families. As we highlighted in the previous slide, the E4C VC has three work groups that operate under the steering committee. These include the Capacity Building Committee, the Parent Voice Committee, and the Data Committee. The Capacity Building Committee provides training and technical assistance to cross-sector partners that deliver services to vulnerable populations. They strengthen organizational capacity, improve services and service delivery, and enhance how underserved communities access services. Mm -hmm. The Parent Voice Committee provides a forum for the social and economic participation of our communities. Parent leaders identify the needs of families and inform the cross-sector county comprehensive efforts to strengthen families. And finally, the Data Committee develops cross-system shared data measures that contribute to a comprehensive understanding of the needs and outcomes of Ventura County families. The Strengthening Families Collaborative is led by the Partnership for Safe Families and Communities the Ventura County Child Abuse Prevention Council. The Strengthening Families Collaborative is organized as the E4C VC Capacity Building Forum. This meeting weaves together the community-based organizations that support children and adults experiencing ACEs and toxic stress. The Strengthening Families Collaborative meets monthly and provides an opportunity for over 70 county stakeholders to develop shared goals and strategies. So how do we help people connect? Let's talk about care coordination. Care coordination is defined as a team-driven activity that can help organize and integrate services as well as support children and adults navigating across clinics, health systems, and services. It can be performed by individuals such as referral coordinators, care navigators, community health workers, social workers, peer support specialists, and behavioral health aides. I'm sure you can think of others who provide this kind of support. Research by Antonelli and colleagues developed a framework for components that support care coordination in, um, in pediatric settings. These include being family-centered, having a plan, being proactive and comprehensive focused, promoting self-care skills and independence, and also emphasizing cross-organizational relationships. There's additional research that shows that care coordination or navigation or behavioral health integration, whatever you wanna call it, improves engagement and access to care. This slide is a graphic visualization to demonstrate the network of care that we are designing and developing here in Ventura County. Help Me Grow Ventura County First Five does parent navigation care coordination for children ages zero to five. The Partnership for Safe Families and Communities, the Child Abuse Prevention Council, also does parent navigation and care coordination However, we extended the developmental lifespan, so now we're reaching out to children six and above into emerging adulthood and their families. And then Gold Coast Health Plan does care management and works with members of the health care plan Medi-Cal. These three systems work collaboratively to help our doctors find ways to connect all of their patients to the buffering resources in our county. If you'd like more information about how we're developing our network of care and some current resources available to you and your patients, you can look at the handouts included in your packet that can help you connect to parent navigators and care coordinators, including those involved with Help Me Grow Ventura County, part of First Five Ventura County, and Gold Coast Health Plan Care Management. For more information about the Ventura County ACEs Network of Care, You'll see contact information and names on the slide and reach out to any one of us and we are more than happy to share with you the quilt that we are weaving in Ventura County to mitigate toxic stress and ACEs for children and families. 
If you have any questions at all or would like to help us weave the network of care quilt, please reach out. Thank you for joining us for our presentation. We hope you found the information useful. As Kathleen said, please feel free to reach out to us with any questions or reach out to ACES Aware Ventura at the information listed on this slide. We look forward to weaving a network of care with all of you in Ventura County. Thank you. Before we get into our Q&A and our comment section, I'm going to um, just read a few reminders about ACES training, certification, and screening. So you'll see the slide on your screen as well. Um, so to become certified to screen for ACES, um, clinical team members who bill Medi-Cal must complete a certified ACES Aware core training and attest to completing the training to qualify to receive Medi-Cal payment for conducting ACES um, or ACE screenings. Um, there is a training called Becoming ACES Aware in California. It is a free two-hour online training that certifies eligible clinici clinicians to receive Medi-Cal payment for ACE screenings. Clinicians and clinical team members will receive two continuing medical, medical education or CME credits and two maintenance of certification or MOC credits upon completion and are encouraged to join the ACES Aware Clinician Directory. So we're going to start the Q&A portion of this presentation. And I'm feeling a little bit like if people are brave enough or interested, we might do it a little bit differently just because there's lots of faces and na well, names, I don't see a lot of faces right now, but names that I recognize. And, and especially as we're talking about a network of care, uh, you are the folks that will be participating in this network of care. So I'd love for this to be a little bit more of a conversation. I know Dr. Landon already was right on top of it at the start of our presentation and put something in the chat, which maybe he can actually say and expand on because it sounds like you had a, an informative session with Dr. Burke Harris. Uh, but again, I feel free if you, um, I know some of you have been participating in the E4CVC. Some of you are very aware of the network of care that we're building. I would love for your input as well. So questions or comments in the chat or feel free to jump in, unmute yourselves and um, show us your lovely faces. So with that maybe Dr. Landon, I'll start with you. If you can expand on the question that you, or the comment and question that you put into the chat. Is the mic working okay? Can you hear me? It's a little bit soft. How about now? Now, better. Now, now. Much there we better. go. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, we had a uh, online uh, presentation with uh, the other ACES uh, awardees, and it, it's always informative what people are doing. They're, people are more maniacal and harder working than we are, which is impossible to even think about. Uh, and Dr. Burke Harris, as you watched her, her eyes would light up at a certain point. She'd be taking notes like crazy. And really, the uh, one of the things that, that came out that uh, uh, you and I discussed a little bit is there's this uh, uh, direction I think they're going to take to actually put the supportive services in the pediatrician's office whenever possible. And that's so they can follow the physical effects as well. So we, as you know, we've gone into Cerner. We can download if someone goes in the emergency room with asthma. Uh, I'm going to know about it so if we can follow the ACEs uh, scores and the like. That was one. And then the other, uh, and she almost jumped up and down in her desk, was uh, doing the ACEs screening uh, in the schools. Uh, and so how, 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 how are we integrating that into our, uh, our, our thinking going forward? Because a lot of the, the interventionists have their own offices, you know, they, but oftentimes those offices, uh, especially with uh, Beacon, sometimes seems like everybody in, in uh, East Ventura needs to go to Simi Valley for services and, and the like, or expected to keep it up with telehealth. So uh, there, that's my question. It's a of course question. you have the answer, so. Yeah. We, of course we do, right, Kathleen? We know everything. <laughs> um, well, I'm interested to know, actually, just kind of throw it back at you. Please. Um, if there were thoughts from the community of practice that was there uh, or what other communities might be doing as far as let's start with putting it into the clinics number one but i think it comes back to funding right and um comes back to also kind of the directives that are coming down at the state level but i'm curious number one mm -hmm. what you may have heard on the, on the line well that's really what i'm looking for is you know come january 1st they're going to say okay you have two days to give a presentation and ray uh, a, a grant uh objective aims specific aims outcomes and i really want to prepare for that as, as best i can 
uh, previously with UCLA, we did the uh, youth partners for care. We had social workers in the office doing the, the depression screening, which now we do, uh, that was in 2005. Uh, and the uh, behavioral health threw us out after we were done. Oh, that's a terrible model. And of course, that's the model they took on uh, over the last five years. So, you know, how do we, uh, on the other hand, when we have, uh, uh, we've had psychiatry in the offices down at uh, I think West Ventura, and they'd see one patient a day. And so if you're a medical director, you go, oh my God, that's a room that could be seeing 20 ear infections, for heaven's sakes, generating RVUs. So I don't, I don't know how the, how the behavioral uh, interventionists, uh, supporters and like, uh, you know, moving from their office into the pediatrician's office, or how they're going to link up into a, a medical record uh, to look at the, the outcomes on blood pressure, obesity, asthma, uh, and so forth. Um, and, I, and I'm assuming the grants are going to head that way. I mean, she's so right. enthusiastic with the support. And I, I really think she's going to move it over to uh, analysis by UCLA, UC San Francisco, yes. just, just some, uh, you know, trying to, again, justify this is, is the right screen, this is the right method. And yeah, and over the next ten years, it may not be the right screen or the right method, but uh, that I think that's a that's a, again something that needs information. That's what she's looking for. Yeah, and I see Dr. Shaw also jumped in, but um, I I think all those things you said are right, and I think that's I think the main thing is that we because we have our Surgeon General in California, Dr. Burke Harris, who obviously has done a lot of research mm -hmm. on ACEs and has really been a mover in this field. Um, to kind of bridge, you know, the, in particular around ACEs and the impact on health since she is a pediatrician, but now expanding into the community, which is what we're doing with the network of care. I think the, the, the change that we saw more recently is because it came at the state level, it came with some funding, right? Medi-Cal providers can bill for screening as a step one. We know that screening is not the be all and end all because now we're talking about intervention services. And I also think that departments that are involved, including the uh, DHCS, so Department of Healthcare Services, that if more state level departments and we get that kind of trickle down effect, you know, I don't think they can mandate anything, but the more that we have that kind of pressure in a way from the, at the state level that comes into our health plans, our managed care plans um, and funding sources, for example, from Medi-Cal that, hey, you need to show certain X, Y, and Z in order to get funding and to be able to bill Medi-Cal. I think that's where we're gonna see the change. It always comes from the funds. Um, and I think I'm, I'm optimistic that the direction that the Surgeon General is taking it is a good one. And we have heard, and Kathleen might know more about this next round of funding that we keep hearing about. And as Dr. Landon and Dr. Van Atwerp know, and some of you who are there with us, they tend to give us like, a week's notice <laughs> when these funds come and say, get this in. And of course, it's always around the holidays when everybody is trying to take time off and they're elsewhere trying to do it. But I think that um, they, there's been too much money and time and effort and data collected for them to let this go. And we're obviously already seeing an impact. So I think that's what's going to get that change in the clinic level. And then we can talk about schools in a moment. But Dr. Shaw, did you have anything to add? I saw you pop in. I had a couple of comments. One is if schools are doing screening and um, primary care offices are doing screening, how do we coordinate the care? And the reimbursement is for one screening a year being paid for. So if they screen in one place, how does the other know about the screening results and coordinating the care? Or are they gonna pay for one a year at school? one a year in a primary care provider's office. So that kind of puts another burden on the communication between the different areas. And then when you were talking, Dr. Landon, about having a psychiatrist in the office, that may not be the best mode of services, but there's a collaborative care model for providing mental health services in primary care offices. And you've got a behavioral health care coordinator that does the um, population-based models of like following screenings for depression, anxiety. We could add the ACEs score to that and that person knows the services and gets the warm handoff and puts them in touch with maybe evidence-based services for mental health or evidence-based services for um, trauma-informed care and reducing the effects of 
toxic stress. So that's something that kind of popped into my mind when you're talking about that. Yeah, we, we do have a child psychiatrist in our office and she's 100% attended. Uh, it's, it was uh, down at the West Ventura Clinic, I think, where they really just, and that's the nature of, of adult uh, mental illness that they're, they're non-adherent to uh, uh, for, for uh, uh, office visits. So uh, yes, on that, I think Cal AIM is going to have to pay for that person uh, in some way without no money, no mission, unless that person is generating income. And, and we're seeing this, we're looking at pediatric infectious disease. Okay. Can they possibly get enough consults uh, in children with COVID-19 or, or unusual infections to support one in our community? And I, so we'll be looking at it, but if there's no money, there's no mission. So uh, I'll be quiet. No, I think that's the bottom line. I'm going to see if my colleague Kathleen has anything to add, and then I'll, we'll jump to Chris because I know we said schools quite a bit in there. So I would love Chris's feedback on that. So you jumped right into my head to jump to Chris because he is here and, and has, I'm sure, critical things to say regarding schools. I'm so glad to see you, Dr. Shaw, and, and this conversation coming to life. The words I keep hearing is collaboration and that this is in Ventura County, a beginning point for a network of care. And through the ACEs Aware funding that has already come to us, it's really been focused on the medical field. And so as far as education, I, I have been recently working with the Department of uh, California Department of Ed and DSS and interviewed Dr. Nadine Burke Harris and worked on some uh, an, a series related to these topics. And I think what was brought forth is if we go into the schools and this next level, right? This next level, when we're talking about circles of socialization or we're talking about you know, the bioecological system, the next level will be schools, but yet that training is not yet there in place for um, doing these assessments or understanding this to that level or referral processes. So I think we have to do a lot of mindful collaboration. This really has come forth and we've been very fortunate in Ventura County through ACEs Aware and the work that Dr. Landon and, and, and uh, the Child Abuse Prevention Council has been doing to lay the foundation, to lay the foundation in the quilt work. And I think these this series and these conversations are critical. The schools obviously are a huge component but I think getting this medical field connected and now the schools, I agree with you, Dr. Shaw, talking about we don't want to have confusion. We want to have clarity and collaboration and make sure we're offering the most, um, I would say, effective services and buffering resources for our families. And so this is a great starting point. This webinar series, this conversation is so critical. But I, but my work and my understanding closely tied to this ACEs Aware funding is we're really tapping into the medical field right now, and then we'll move out into all of these layers simultaneously, but mindfully, so that there's communication and um, training is really critical. So I'll hand that over to you, Chris, if what I'm saying, as I pass the baton, you're in education, and I know you're in both arenas. You work with the Child Abuse Prevention Council and the ACEs Aware work that we're doing. Let, let me just make one more comment. So we had school-based health services, and until they uh, went to managed care Medi-Cal, at which point there could be five different healthcare plans in one school. So we couldn't do it efficiently. You can't just see one. If they're seen at Clinica, there's Del Camino Royale, then I can't see them at when they're at Ventura High School. And uh, it just made no economic sense. So that would have to change too at the level of Cal AIM, uh, uh, probably supporting school and health services. And, and the other Chris, yay, go. Yeah, I, I would agree with you, Dr. Landon. Um, be, before I make a comment, I just want to let you know that I do have my eye on your pearl drum set there in the background, and much admiring that. <laughs> Come on down. Come on. We got a stage already here for you. Okay. Well, well I'll start getting warmed up. <laughs> um, and good evening. My name is Chris Ridge, and I'm Director of Comprehensive Health and Prevention for the Ventura County Office of Education. And um, glad to be here and see such interest in this particular focus area. Comprehensive health at the Ventura County Office of Education is broad and does en encompass social emotional learning, which involves trauma informed care and all the topics we've been discussing today. And I've long been working in um, my domain within education to coordinate the integration 
of support services um, cross sector as Kathleen has been speaking about and Sharon been speaking about too. And I think that the, the hurdle that we face in education is analogous to what it is that we've been describing and talking about within medicine, which is that after first educators overcome the initial uh, struggle with sitting down with an ACES screener and, and you know asking those questions and the necessary training that goes along with it, as Kathleen had mentioned. The next component is the piece that is also being addressed within the medical field, which is, and now what? And what are we going to do about it? Um, educators in general are quite familiar with what's going on in the lives of our children, even though we don't sit down necessarily formally with an ACES screener. Um, we will probably be able to have pretty good insight into uh, our children and, and what uh, kinds of traumas they have experienced. But the, the, you know, um, I think Kathleen definitely hit the nail on the head in terms of how it is that we're working in coordination of services because there is, as we all recognize and understand so much work that is compartmentalized and, and siloed and we don't wanna duplicate efforts and we wanna be well coordinated and communicated. From my perspective, in addition to the training component and the development of a coordinated system of care, uh, the other piece that I think goes along with that that I just want to highlight is uh, the, the type of system that we have in place for the exchange of information, i.e. a community information exchange type model that allows for a seamless, seamless kind of coordination between agencies who's, uh, who may speak sort of different languages, have different um, parameters governing them, um, different protocols and even different technologies within them, but a system that, that, that kind of spans all of that and allows for uh, timely access to information and serving families. So those are some of my initial thoughts on it from the education perspective. Thank you, Chris, for mentioning also the community information exchange. I think that's kind of the piece that Dr. Shaw was mentioning of how do we know if someone else has been doing it? I know there's, and I have been out of the conversation for a few months since I left First Five, but I know there's been a lot of uh, activity and um, around, you know, this county in particular, looking for a, a CIE or community information exchange that could be helpful across agencies and organizations. Um, and from the state level, the, the Surgeon General's office is actually has included in, in in particular the last grant, and I think they were starting to with the other grant as well, that that you had to select some kind of database technology system, which you know is kind of newer. In the past, I know many grants wouldn't even look at if you were talking about some kind of database, they weren't going to fund it. But I think finally they're recognizing that agencies, uh, public or not, need to talk to each other, and that the only way we're going to do kind of seamless care coordination is that if we know what's happening with the family, the child, the individual, the adult that's in front of us, you know, if we don't know what's happening in their world. So I don't know if anybody has any updates on the CIE here in the county, but I know it's, there's a lot of talk about it. Uh, with Family Justice Center, we talked about using uh, Unite Us and uh, there are other counties that have adopted. I don't think we have, so I don't know where it stopped in its uh, assessment. I can say with the Child Abuse Prevention Council, the Partnership for Safe Families and Communities, through the ACEs Aware funding, we did bring on Unite Us as well. And we are still in the process of developing that system. And we did that mindfully because we knew that other agencies within our county were working with Unite Us. So hopefully we can all continue that process and move forward with that. And I actually wanted to make one more comment around the schools um, because I'm kind of in it right now. As some of you know that I, I'm working for the Ventura County Office of Education through the CELPA, uh, the Special Education Local Plan Area, if you're not familiar. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm contracted to Ventura Unified School District. They received what is called an Expanded Learning Opportunities Grant or ELL grant. And what they chose to do was put those funds into, uh, which I'm a part of, a general education behavior team. There are two of us who are BCBAs, so we come from that behavioral perspective. Uh, as board certified behaviorists. And there are two what's called social emotional services specialists or CESs. One has an MFT, one's a licensed counselor. And so we work as a team in the elementary schools in Ventura at Ventura Unified and respond to kids who might be struggling behaviorally, social emotionally in the elementary school setting. And it's been really interesting because 
you know, I've, I've, my background is in behavior, but I've, of course I've been involved in some of the ACEs aware work. And so we are in with our two therapists, we've been taking kind of that trauma informed lens as well. And recognizing, of course, as kids came back into in-person learning from the pandemic, that that in of itself, you know, was traumatic and it's been difficult. But I think there's starting to be recognition in the schools that this is something, an area that they need to work on because kind of have like we have special ed, but that's not quite right for some of the things that we're talking about that does not support all children. Um, there's other other types of things that there, there is a need, there's a, a kind of a gap to support needs around behavior and trauma and all of that. Um, at other districts, you know, Wainimi district also has put some money through the SELPA into a general ed uh, sp social emotional specialist. So I think there is some movement there in the schools recognition and there actually are some funds and again it comes back down to what we said it's all about the dollar the bottom line but I'm, i think people are starting to recognize it so i'm hopeful that we'll see more districts come on board with that yeah, i think i could add to that too sharon that um this is on the heels of me just concluding a training about an hour and a half ago in social and emotional learning with 22 secondary educators from across the county and um, that particular training being focused upon social emotional learning through uh, what we call the Castle Model Collaborative for Academic and Social Emotional Learning um, is, a, is a core component of what we're talking about with the intervention and prevention and serving children who are impacted by trauma. And so there's, a, there's an increasing demand upon that work. And that's what I train within that. I train within restorative justice practices, social emotional learning, positive behavior interventions and supports, um, trauma-informed care, of course. So all of those are, are being offered by the County Office of Education and more and more educators are uh, uh, even with all the demands upon folks now um, coming forward and wanting those trainings and, and beginning to work more uh, with individual school districts on their specific needs in terms of what it is that they need in their local community. And so we're really happy to be able to support in that area. It's really nice, Sharon. Thank you for hanging in there since you just came off another training. <laughs> you get extra brownie points tonight. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, so we're what, just... would, what would be very exciting to me uh, is for uh, ACEs scoring on all those children, just because our, our, you know the hypothesis is every every teacher knows their kids and they, are they missing something? And the other, uh, do those children are those the toxic stress kids that we're really picking out? Uh, and Dr. Burke Harris, I think, would cut your heart and fall over if we were to show that relationship. So is in terms of uh, individual schools, does it need to go to the school board for approval? Uh, can we do it through the Ventura County Medical Center IRB? Uh, what, would it, what would it take? Because those questions are tough questions, Chris. Uh, you know. Definitely is an individual um, school district level type of a discussion and different districts are in different places in terms of their readiness and willingness to take that on. There's some, some levels of sensitivity depending upon the community and, and bringing those questions forward and, and the way that teachers may feel um, well poised or not is often the case, um, given their background experience and training or lack thereof. And so all of those constraints and more that I'm not naming here to kind of factor into a district's um, willingness to, to actually uh, make that commitment so that it's, it's very much tied to um, uh, us working together to assess who's ready and going with um, the folks that are that are first most willing, I think, is the way that it will go. Um, and then bringing everybody else along as we go. And that's how I would suggest the people, the, the children who are getting intervention, just starting there. Uh, so, Dr. Rather, Lannan, rather, rather than rather than school as wide, a, right? As a screener, yeah. Well, just. Uh, and also to test test the uh, uh, the referring ability. How did they get in there? Is it because of uh, of the ACEs scores or something else going on? So anyway. So I think um, one thing that I would uh, want to mention in regards to that is important component here that that is tying together some pieces is the uh, work that is being done right now at eight of our high schools within the county through what's called the wellness centers. And you may have seen those, there were some recent articles in the paper and whatnot. And so um, that is a collaborative effort between Ventura County Office of Education, Ventura County Behavioral Health. And there's a, a good inflection point to be able to integrate 
that work in there. I think it's a point of discussion and I think it's a point of development. I think that your point is well taken to be able to, okay, when we look about a continuum of care and, and, and you know, bringing kids into some level of care, at what point do we make sure that at least within that particular system that we're uh, integrating the use of the, the ACE screener? So I think you bring up a very good point. And, and then work. when you have the school system involved, recently the legislature um, passed a bill for um, insurance, private insurance companies to cover ACEs screening, but then we don't know what happens after they're screened and the resources for that. And when you're dealing with schools, you can't just say, okay, we're just going to take the Medi-Cal kids and do this. And the other kids were not, some may be uninsured. So that adds a whole nother layer of complexity. And as a pediatrician or psychiatrist, I hate to treat kids differently based on their insurance. I just go so against my core. Yep. You hit the nail on the head there too with that. So, so many things to be worked out in, in our partnership. And I think that means that there's more work to be done and hopefully more funds coming our way to do that work, um, more conversations to be had. And I, hopefully we've got a few ideas tonight. We're just past the hour. So I wanna see if there's any final questions. And if not, I'm going to give my colleague who hopefully is still there an opportunity to kind of give any final comments or words that she has um, before we sign off. So any final thoughts or comments? And then again, I'll have um, Kathleen jump in with anything else that she wants to say. Okay, Kathleen, are you still there? I know she's not. She's not in the area right now, so I'm hoping she can still. I, I am. I am. I'm oh. here, and yes, <laughs> I am still here. I am not in the area, and I was having some. There's a storm where I am, but I'm here. Um, I, you probably didn't catch what I just said. I think we're we're just about closing up, and I want to see if you had any final thoughts or comments before we we sign off for the evening. Well, I think my final thoughts and comments are the appreciation of everyone that took the time to come here this evening and to recognize the importance of the network of care that we are truly building in our county. And the ACEs Aware funding has been phenomenal. Um, I have felt that that funding has been mindful in giving it directly to on the ground, boots on the ground, agencies that just were making it happen and it's going and it's growing. And so I'm excited. I'm thankful to be a part of this. And I know that everyone who's on the call this evening um, is a contributor to the work that we're doing. We're building a quilt and we're building a network of care and I'm appreciative and I thank you all. And I'm, I'm so happy to be a part of this team. Thank you everybody for attending the session. Like Kathleen just said, we really appreciate you hanging in there. I love the conversation. I know again, those are just some starting conversations. There'll be more to come. Um, and hopefully you learned a little bit more about what is happening in Ventura County. I know many of our talks were a little bit more global and this one was specific to Ventura County. So hopefully if you hadn't heard about it, you're excited about what we're doing. And if you had that, you, you recognize you're still part of it and we're still moving forward with that. So thank you again for joining us. Um, please stay on for some important reminders. Uh, from the Land and Pediatric Foundation and our ACES grant coordinators. Thank you again for watching this lecture. Remember to complete the registration and evaluation. We will contact you soon if you are one of our raffle winners, so stay tuned. Make sure to follow us on all our social media accounts and subscribe on our webpage for more information of our 12 lecture series, ACEs Aware Ventura County, and all things ACEs Aware. Thank you for joining us on our mission to bring better help, better health, and better hope to Ventura County and beyond. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful evening, night, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you, Sharon and Kathleen, for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Happy holidays. Thanks everybody for joining. And that is the conclusion of our ACES Aware Ventura County Lecture Series. <laughs> so thank you again to our speakers, Kathleen and Sharon, and to Dr. Landon, and as well to all of our participants for that lively discussion. And we're excited for the work to continue. So thanks again and have a good night. Thank you, Daisy and Amani.
all that work. Thank you. (laughs)